welcome back. So um, I thought it would be a good idea to have a little bit of a, a summation of the workshop, as, as difficult as that might be. Um, this is just, um, as it's a workshop, um, so this is, it's, it's on the way to a summation. We're not looking for Hegelian synthesis here, but, but rather kind of meditative coming together to, to think about how we've seen the different themes, uh, motifs reflected from two, um, I think, but I could be wrong, uh, com compatible ways of, of, of thinking. Again, largely and broadly speaking, analogical, metaxological metaphysics and mimetic theory. So um, the format of the, of the summation, which we'll, we'll open with Cyril and he, he will just have um, a few words to kind of think about how we can think these themes uh, together and, and how he um, perceived a lot of um, the interpretive possibilities, which should be interesting, of course. Um, and then we'll hand it over to, to Wolfgang to do the same. And then what I would like to do is invite the audience participants um, to come up not with questions um, so much, or if it's a question that's opening the dialogue between the two, you can do that as well, but more to sort of say, this is participating in this workshop, how did I, how did I see it unfold? Um, what were some of the things that struck me about the dialogue and the, and the fruitfulness or also the, the constructive disagreement of maybe it doesn't work. Um, so again, this is an open workshop um, and everyone's welcome. So let me hand it over first to, to Cyril um, with some remarks. So the task, possible and impossible, both I think in terms of conjugating both substance and method, to very, very different thinkers in very, very different contexts, or rather, theology and its thinkers, and Girard, and I suppose the ways in which he has been recalibrated. It has been attempted, uh, it, the attempt has been performed, and the accomplishment uh, is, I think, in the wild blue yonder, that is, we don't know sort of what the accomplishment is. I reminded what Michael Kerwin said this morning, about the perennial prospect of speaking past each other. So I assume sort of some of that has occurred, even if we sort of, uh, well, differ with respect to sort of know what did pass uh, each other in the night. Nonetheless, overall this was a workshop, though the papers themselves did not feel or look much like workshop papers. They were very professional, uh, they were conference standard. Or put it this way, they were not incohate papers. I'm thankful for that. It doesn't mean that they were not workshop papers. I'm thankful for that insofar as the people who know stuff well indicated how well performed their knowledge well. And I think so that, that sort of uh, helped all of us to see so there's no what uh, is untangled, can be untangled, or will remain sort of no kind of in a tangle and probably there'll be a great deal more sort of of the last than the other two. For me, I'd seem, for me, even though I am Irish and a talker, um, for me, I think the best aspect of the workshop were the questions that came from the audience, that is. The questions were invited formally, but uninvited insofar as you can never determine sort of you know, what someone's going to make of a paper or what sort of particular kind of set of cerebral ricochets are going to go on such that so there's no something that comes out. And one learns, I think, from that contingency or kind of set of accidents, very much as much as you would learn sort of know from papers sort of which have substance and style uh, and sort of know which are making an argument. I would just say some things about eschewing the self-congratulations so that, that would, I think, sink uh, this as a workshop. I think we can say in all modesty something like the following. I think there has been a useful sifting of the different capacities of Girard in his various stages, different capacities for fruitful theological appropriation, though perhaps all of it 
comes under fruitful theological exploration and conversation. So it was very clear, it seems to me, that a distinction was being made between what uh, we can have by way of discussion between theology and Girard and what sort of, shall we say, might be fruitfully appropriated. That is, where we had a higher order index in which sort of there's a meshing, so there's no all, so if you like, the two disciplines. If we regard Girard as a discipline, although obviously he's a conjury sort of of particular disciplines. Particular items that sort of were important, I think, were distinctions between good and bad desire, good and bad forms of Im imitation, both in terms of substance and modality. And of course, implied at least, and I don't think we entirely thematized it, but for me it was important, uh, is a sense in which is there, is there is, where will we find a complex of good desire, a community of good desire? Is that community possible uh, in history or is there always an eschatological intention with respect to this? And in this respect, whether Girard in particular, and some Christian theologians as well, are thinking sort of of the good and the good community, are thinking sort of of Eden eschatologically and not protologically. There were, of course, extended conversations between Girard on the one hand and Christian thinkers on the other. Uh, that is, we had Kierkegaard sort of uh, uplifted, we had Girard uplifted on a couple of occasions, uh, and Shivara obviously going sort of under the analogical index, I take it sort of that even Joshua wasn't inclined to suggest uh, that uh, Kierkegaard sort of functioned, you know, analogically, and I thought uh, his purpose was a kind of dialectical leaven. There was, but I think without it being rendered explicit, recognition sort of of methodological differences between Girard and philosophy and theology, uh, though, of course, uh, it's difficult, first of all, to say with Girard that he has one methodology. I think we'd have a lot of hyphens between the kind of methodologies that he has. And it's not also the case that theology and philosophy have any one methodology. So I think we're thinking of a, a kind of concentrated plural against absolute plurals in terms of methodology on the other side. So that, I think, is something that was hit on, gestured towards, not necessarily fully exemplified in any event, so that, that that is an entire universe of tangles. Apocalyptic entered into the discussion, it seems to me, both implicitly and explicitly, in papers and, I think, in discussion. It entered, uh, on, I think, on behalf sort of, of Girard, or at least it seems to me a category sort of that is a summation category with respect to his work, at least uh, he sums, he certainly sums up his works sort of in that particular way, and whether it functions sort of you know, as a category to unlock or unveil sort of his prior work, I leave to others to decide. I'm inclined to actually think it does. And certainly we had sort of in some thinkers, Givari sort of is, is I think the clearest example, that we have apocalyptic forms of theology which are entirely traditional. They're not to the side sort of, you know, of mainline theology, that they are a representant inflection uh, of theology, sort of, of a highbrow. I, I would actually think sort of Shivari is one of those, Hans von Balthasar is an apocalyptic theologian in my view too, though normally you might tend to think of him sort of as some kind of aesthetic theologian sort of, you know, who is, yes, he's bringing forward a tradition, but essentially sort of, you know, he is trying to package sort of Christianity uh, in an aesthetic form and make it look nice uh, and uh, make it look like as if it's beauty and so forth, and we can receive it in a different way. But ultimately, if you think of theodrama, he's an apocalyptic theologian. That, however, is an incredible advantage for dialogue, it seems to me. If you have sort of mainline theologians who are not outside, uh, who sort of are apocalyptic, and the comparandum sort of is Girard, that, it seems to me, sort of to be just simply a scene sort of our fruitful exercises with respect to uh, proximities. The other side of that, of course, is uh, what kinds of persons uh, somehow or other can provide you with wrong form of apocalyptic? Well, I think I said previously that Girard battling to the end seems to me sort of to be battling other counterfeit forms of apocalyptic from his point of view. And of course, he thinks that they have, they have 
either sort of kind of feigned Christian index or could be perceived so to uh, be Christianly friendly or not obviously hostile. And I, I think that for the purpose of here, though he does attack Hegel sort of as well as Heidegger, he attacks Heidegger and he also attacks Heidegger on Hölderlin because he wants to rescue Hölderlin as a Christian. Uh, he doesn't want so he doesn't want Hölderlin to be regarded sort of as a Nietzschean apocalypticist. He wants to regard him as a Christian apocalypticist of sorts, which interestingly is precisely sort of you know, what Shivara did. In the air also, Heidegger was in the air even when he wasn't spoken, and I spoke to him in any event at the opening session, which wasn't officially in the workshop, but I think wasn't entirely irrelevant to it either. It seemed to me sort of that uh, there were whisperings of Augustine uh, throughout the entire conference. And, and that's in kind of necessary. Shivara, for instance, is regarded as like a kind of second Augustine. Someone is always a second something in modernity, but, um, uh, but he probably sort of deserves it. Uh, but also, I think, whisperings of diagnosis. If you're going to give a th theological diagnosis outside sort of you know, the method of Girard, how would you account him? Uh, I said sort of you know, in a, a group sort of setting sort of the other evening, I said, well, the one thing we can say about Girard is if you're going to find a theological analog, it wouldn't be Thomas Aquinas. Now, of course, you could exclude many others too, but just in case you want kind of your Catholic credentials, it cannot be Thomas Aquinas. And it cannot be Thomas Aquinas so because uh, the analysis, the analysis uh, of scapegoating and analysis of imitation of, of the sort of you know, the faulted form um, is it, it, so searing. Uh, is so searing and so global, the, the analog within the uh, Christian tradition has to be Augustine. The decision that has to be made is which Augustine? So we had different Augustines appearing at different times because Augustine is a universe of Augustines, unlike Thomas is only a universe of Thomas. Um, but whether we have an Augustine sort of of a radical form uh, and whether so that's the analog, that is, uh, one reading of Girard, the early Girard, would be sort of, well, we're always already fallen. We're already sort of, uh, sort of in sort of this network of imitation and mimesis and scapegoating. Uh, therefore, we have original sin which reproduces itself. And that sort of seems like, is that actually an analog of absolute corruption, that Augustine, which is taken over sort of, you know, by the Reformation? Or isn't an Augustine sort of that takes seriously the fall? But we're not absolutely corrupted. There are going to be moments of good mimesis and so forth. But even the moments of good mimesis, you never get carried away. You never get rhapsodic, to use John's term. You can't get rhapsodic about the good. The good sort of is always threatened, and the good sort of can be often exceptional. Augustine has been, I wouldn't even say the silent partner, but the, whis the whispered partner of, I think, our entire dialogue. So I think this is kind of being an Augustinian conference in the end. That's about as much as I think I want to say. Wolfgang, please. Yeah, thank you. Maybe I just say a word. I think that's absolutely true that uh, Girard fits with Augustine or certain, di uh, certain parts of Augustine, not with Thomas Aquinas because he once said, I'm interested in thinkers of crisis. And Augustine is much more a thinker of crisis uh, Thomas Aquinas is more a uh, think of order and stability. And so that's, that's I think, is just confirming what, what Cyril said. So uh, let me look at my notes. I, I just uh, got the invitation for this task yesterday in the evening, so I started to make notes today. <laughs> but, I <laughs> but I look a little bit back. Michael said today, and I think that also comprises our workshop that uh, we lift the hermeneutic of generosity. And I think that is really true because I've already been at uh, a lot of events where Girardians and people from other disciplines or philosophers came together. And most of the time it ended up in, in, in types of clash or debunking of each other. So I always uh, or often had this kind of sterile clashes between philosophy, theology on the one hand, and Girard's mimetic theory on the other. And this didn't happen here, which was a surprise for me, a, a, a good surprise. 
and uh, a good experience uh, of, of, of listening. And just to make some, uh, or underline this, this experience, when William Desmond talked about Shira, I felt it was not immediately showing the weakness, the philosophical weakness, what is all lacking, but I felt it was an opening up, a listening, uh, reaching out, where can there be common ground, where are the differences, so it was uh, understanding in that direction. When Michael Kerwin today, as one of the Girardians, gave a paper on Girard, it was a critique of Girard, also surprising, maybe opening up uh, to the others that the Girardians are not a sect uh, that <laughs> celebrate their uh, French-American saint. Uh, yeah, but, and, and maybe even the term Girardian is a bad term because Girard himself talked in the last 20 years always about mimetic theory. So saying this is an enterprise of several people and it's not a cult about uh, a particular person. Also Joshua uh, showed an opening uh, in, in the Kierkegaard, so I, I think you, you were also opening up and, and uh, uh, Philip today, uh, I think that was the paper with the term imitation, the most often used uh, word imitation <laughs> in one paper. So uh, it was a rhapsody in some way and, and whenever the word mimesis or mimetic or imitation came up, I chimed in and <laughs> <laughs> sang the song. So I noted some questions and uh, we don't have to discuss them, but these are also questions we can take with us to, to think uh, along that way. So one question that interests me a lot and I have not a quick answer was what William uh, yesterday, no, yeah, yesterday to Grant's paper. You know, Grant uh, uh, talked about the tomb so that uh, the doom as the offspring and the central part of human culture. And William uh, questioned, is, is burials, is our way of dealing with mortality, is that just this violent aspect or are there aspects of reverence? So I think that's a, a question we should go deeper into it, think about it, and then there was another question that came up today also several times and yesterday. Is desire only lack or is desire plenitude? So how does this go together? For me, for me in the last uh, couple of years, I always uh, saw a complementarity between Shira and uh, Ernest Becker's book, Denial of Death, because he has some very interesting mimetic observations, Becker, without knowing Shira, and he, he, uh, with him you could say Shira's lack of being has also something to do with uh, mortality. And mortality is something humans have to face. It's a big difference between animals and humans that we know that we are mortal, and, and this is a little bit more difficult than if you do not know that, and that's a big challenge. So for me that's a thing we have to think about and it was addressed in several ways. So John ended his paper with a reference to the valley of death, which I found interesting because that's something we have to reflect. But then you later said you never uh, reflected a lot about death. But I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something we have to do because this is a, uh, a human existential, a human challenge, and you cannot push it away uh, easily. And I think uh, maybe that's, that's uh, one of the reasons that also is a question that I noted down also after your lecture, because there was also, well, there was an Augustinian whispering but there was quite an open, even recorded uh, debunking and critique of Heidegger. And I like uh, critique of Heidegger. It's a <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, there is a, a little but. Uh, 
you talk so much and criticize so much Heidegger, so either he is really a very bad thinker and, a, and really terrible, why do we talk about him? So <laughs> I, I would like to hear a little bit more why is it important to keep uh, Heidegger alive in our discussions before we, so is there some strengths? Did he understand some things? Sometimes my impression is if there would not be resurrection, if there would not be the Christian hope to overcome this, if it would not be true what St. Paul in the letter to the Corinthians wrote, if there is no correction, uh, resurrection, everything would be just be wrong. If, if that would be true, uh, maybe Heidegger would be the best philosopher because he dealt with a world in which the death is the ultimate God or divinity, and so to say. So therefore, we should, before we debunk uh, powerfully a thinker who is worse to be debunked, we should make him stronger because then our <laughs> criticism is stronger. So one of the questions is, why should we still deal and read with Heidegger, and I noted John um, uh, at least gave in his paper, uh, said something positive about Heidegger today. <laughs> I, I do not remember now, but you said one of the insights of how Heidegger is valuable, right? And then there was uh, connected to the last paper, Philip, but it was also, I think, part of the whole workshop, this relationship uh, between metaphysics and mimetic theory. And that's also something that has to be explored uh, more in depth. I mean, Shira is really outside any kind of philosophical broader system is even the wrong word, broader uh, philosophical metaphysical framework and that's lacking in, 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 in him. And partly I think we were at least able to show how it could go together. And I think it's, it's important to have this broader view, but uh, it has to be fleshed out more in detail. That's roughly what I've noted. Thank Wonderful, you. thank you both to Cyril and, and to Wolfgang. So if I could invite um, participants, both speakers and, and audience participants to to come up, um, if, you, if you so wish, um, to offer how you viewed the event. Um, how are you interpreting it? Um, where do we need to go? What was fruitful? What needs to be uh, still worked on? Michael? Uh, thanks very much to both. Uh, just a quick couple of comments, which I think came to me after the previous session, which I thought might help to close the circle a little bit. Uh, first of all, the question around uh, relating ourselves to death and so on. Uh, the studies that I was doing years ago were around the theme of Christian martyrdom, which is how I first came to be looking at, uh, at Girard. And, um, and uh, just the, the, the conception of martyrdom from a Christian perspective is it's about being a readiness for death, but not embracing it in a kind of masochistic kind of way. And the other point that's related to that is, um, to close the circle, uh, the, the warnings against envy through which death came into the world. So there is that link within the early tradition of death and envy. Um, maybe there's something to be worked through there. Thank, Thank you. you, Michael. <coughs> Jacob? On the whole, I came into the conference without a lot of knowledge of Girard, and I deeply appreciated uh, not only exposition of his thought, but also kind of, in some cases, a presentation that was approachable uh, to his thought as well. Um, I found myself particularly appreciating the narrative turn in your talk, Dr. Kaplan, as we walked through the, uh, the quartet, uh, Napolitan Quartet, and found myself reflecting on that and, and your paper as well on um, the Lord Jesus Christ's death and the gospel itself as a radical exposure of a primordial violence that we would prefer to keep kept hidden. Uh, but in the death of the Son of God, uh, uh, he dies a death chosen by the crowd, uh, as it were, um, and leaves a world exposed 
and literally in the Gospels darkened in response to his death uh, then in response to his resurrection we are uplifted uh, and into the heights as it were in apocalyptic longing for his return and I was very appreciative of all the papers given and, and I thought that uh, as someone who is still trying to find his bearings in relationship with philosophy and theology uh, very helpful so I pass that along thank you very much thank you William. Uh, it's, it's a simple uh, question, and it, uh, 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 a picture has been ha haunting us. Uh, and if you look behind, uh, and I, it's precipitated in some sense by the remarks of Florence, here you have it in the sense of, I presume that's Eve, and she doesn't have a face. I presume that's Adam, and he has half a face. And I'm just kind of, I, I mean, I, I, when I saw that in the invitation and so on, I was wondering, well, what is this? I, I, I mean, I can see the, the Garden of Eden and all of that. But um, it's only towards the end of our discussions, really, that in a more explicit sense that the question of evil was strongly formulated. But I, I would just like to draw attention to the need to reflect on where, where this picture came from and it would provide us with perhaps some food for thought in multiple directions. It's, it's Edvard Munch, so the, the painter of the scream. Um, and I was looking for some form of artwork that would try to encapsulate somewhat um, the, um, well, temptation, desire, right? Um, and it, but it, also the anonymity, so it goes back to, to Cyril's question of if, if we're failing to imitate who we should really be imitating, um, does that mean that we are less of what we should be? Um, and, and clearly, in, in terms of uh, artistic representation, uh, that's a pretty powerful one and, and quite disturbing. Um, as Michael's, you know, um, Using using Blake, uh, Blake is also disturbing in some ways, but uh, visually, I mean, he's always so striking to to to, to see them, um, and um, yeah, and then novelistically, with with um, with um, Grant's paper, I mean, so we we also had some very vivid uh, representations of the, the, the more abstract realities um, that we're trying to make a little bit more concrete. So thank you, William, um, Kate. You are going to have to excuse the side that I'm a lazy undergrad, so some of this did go over my head. But in many areas, I was able to understand it, so there was cohesion in that. But I kind of want to present a response to one of the questions in your paper. And I also want to thank Grant for your presentation on the Neapolitan novels. And there is still representation of women in that. And I think also the consciousness of language that was used um, within our field of awareness, we are specifically seated in the space of thinking. And hopefully that thinking will change into a practical space. Um, and I, so I think when we bring up the feminist conversation, we also need to be cognitive of where we're standing at the moment in time. Um, and so we were still represented in your talks. <laughs> so I don't know if that, that is just a response to the earlier question on that. Yeah, no, I mean, so there was, there was um, the, the, the female um, representatives were not able to make it to the, to the conference. Um, so that was a very unfortunate uh, coincidence. If you look at any other event that I've uh, organized and any uh, volume that I've edited, the representation is very important uh, to me. But sometimes it's, it's almost impossible. Um, and there was just a bad coincidence with uh, other events that people were at. Um, but with the edited volume as well, we're, we're, we're looking into how to fix some of these things up. So uh, the, all these things have to be brought to a fore. They're very important, and we're not trying to sweep them under the rug um, by any means. So thank you. John? If, if no one else is going to say anything else. Um, uh, with regard to what uh, um, uh, William pointing to the Munch painting, I thought it was maybe prophetic because 
in some ways, it, it contains an answer um, to some of the questions. Um, the exhortation from Pindar, become what you are. Um, it, this makes me, reminded me, once William said that, reminded me of Lewis's, till we have faces. Um, and so really um, there we have a kind of key to Christian anthropology is that we are, we are becoming who we are in Christ, right? Um, but um, first of all, with regard to what Cyril and, and Wolfgang did, thank you for the, the masterful summaries and uh, the, the gathering up of the fragments that none may be lost. Um, with, in that regard, I, I wanted to refer to something that Aaron said earlier to me. I think it was over lunch. Where is Aaron? Is he still here? No, he had to leave, John. He had to Sorry. leave, but he yeah. said something wonderful. He said, with regard to death, that we die to individuality, but not to personality. Um, and in a you know, modern Western context, it's all about individualism. Um, it seemed, that seemed perfectly right and apt. And I wanted to honor what he said, because we, we die to ourselves as individuals, but not to ourselves as persons. And it's rather that we become persons through that death, as it were. Um, and that's just the fulfillment of the baptismal you know, the promise. Um, with regard to what Wolfgang said, uh, picking up the fragments, uh, you asked about what I said about Heidegger. I, I think I just said that, the, and I, I want to balance it out. I mean, uh, there are things, um, we wouldn't be wrestling with Heidegger so much if he didn't say so much that was true. And I think that's, that's the, 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 yeah, the, that's the reason we are wrestling. That's why Cyril wrestles with them. Why right? we wrestle with Hegel because they say so many things are right, but which makes them also, you know, very troubling because it, um, they speak half truths sometimes. But the half truth, at least, which must be honored, I think, is that he forces us to to ask the question of being in an age that has forgotten it. I mean, it's just in the same way that Kierkegaard says we've forgotten what it means to exist. And I mean, they they are you know two peas in a pod there in that sense. I mean, and also the, just the recognition that we can't um, really know what it means to be uh, human beings apart from the question of being. I mean, that's just an absolutely central insight. I mean, no, no anthropology without ontology. I think a Christian has to affirm that too. It's just the question of what kind of ontology and what kind of uh, metaphysics. Um, to sum up the, the workshop, if you asked us to do that, um, it, it, it was a beautiful one, Philip. Um, I'm so honored to be here. Um, it worked, the workshop worked, I thought. Um, there was that spirit, a, a hermeneutic of generosity that Wolfgang was talking about. Um, and we analogized, I mean, I think Shivara would like to put it this way, if I may speak for him. We analyzed, analogized Shivara and Girard um, precisely in the sense of that he takes analogy in that primary sense of allo pros allo, you know, one thing to another, without erasing differences, but reading the one toward the other. Um, you know, that's, that's the, how he thinks, you know, ana analogically, not dialectically, not univocally. Um, and in that sense, it's like bringing together points of, of the base of a triangle, I think. And the beauty of that is that when you bring two different things together, they themselves are pointing to a higher horizon and a higher resolution. So maybe the, the summation then is that we have been in bringing these two great thinkers together and many more um, kind of on the, on the margins of our discourse where we've pointed ourselves or pointed to a higher horizon and greater clarity about what it means to be and what it means to be a human being. Um, I take it that that, that seems to be the takeaway. Um, finally, uh, you know, since we, somebody asked earlier, you know, where's the Holy Spirit in this? And I thought that, who was it that asked that question? I can't remember. Maybe that person's Cyril, gone. Cyril. It's, oh, always, Cyril. it's always Cyril. Oh, Cyril, of course. Well, the, the, the Irish genius here. Okay, I mean, so, okay. Where is the Holy Spirit? And I thought that was a, that was the most perfect, you know, you know, conclusion because we know by faith that the, the Holy Spirit is the one who conforms us to Christ. Um, and with with um, regard to Girard, and it seems that we now need the Holy Spirit to stay focused on the right model, so to speak. Right. Um, with regard to Shivara, his understanding of, of the human being, we need the Holy Spirit to close the gap that has, has opened up in a fallen world between essence and existence, so to speak, um, to analogize them and bring them closer together um, as analogs uh, of, the tri of the Trinity, ultimately. Um, so we, we, we came up with, the, well, we, at least I mentioned Pindar, the exhortation, become what you are, 
uh, from a purely natural standpoint, that could lead to despair, surely. Well, you know, first of all, what am I and what am I supposed to become? How do I become that um, at a purely natural level? But the Holy Spirit, so maybe we need another exhortation or at the end, you know, or, or rather a prayer, you know, veni, sancte, spiritus. Um, then we might fulfill the vision of both Shivara and Girard. Um, so thank you for the conference. <coughs> All right, um, so I'm afraid we are running a little bit late. Um, so unless there's a, a pressing summation out there in the audience, uh, I don't want to exclude anybody, but... Um, Can I say one thing real fast? Uh, only one thing, Grant. It has you been univocal, so state it univocally, please. Well, just real quickly on the Holy Spirit, because you talked about John a lot, and in John's Gospel, the Holy Spirit is the advocate. It's the paraclete. And for Girardians, the advocate is important because it's the defense attorney. And Satan is the accuser. And so the, the Holy Spirit, um, it is the one who's going to be with the disciples after Jesus leaves. You know, when the whole crowd is saying they're guilty and they should be, they should be killed, the Holy Spirit's there and so I think you know, we, we've had Rhapsody, um, and uh, I, I, uh, I'm a bit Irish myself, so I like Rhapsody, but I also like uh, Melancholy, and, uh, and so I, you know, I think we should both be rhapsodic about the beauty of the gospel, but also uh, if, if we're uh, Christians, make sure that we remember the Holy, Holy Spirit is the advocate for the, those who are, are victims, and uh, you know, but for the grace of God, go I. And thank you very much for everything. It's been wonderful here. Thank you. Um, so, you know, we 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 began with thanks, and and um, we we end with thanks, and, and that's not um, said lightly. Um, but I, I spe specifically want to thank um, the participants um, in the audience that that you know, when you plan an event, you you can't you know, philosophically plan an event, but you, you make something of the conditions um, available for the event to occur, and you, and you never know what's going to happen because precisely it's, it's dialogical. And, and so the questions from, from the audience um, were, were wonderful and unanticipated. So again, I, I, I wanna thank um, the audience, um, the speakers, um, Sean, who, who made um, the conditions of the event possible um, for, it, for it to come into, uh, to be spoken into existence. And um, I, I'm, I'm really grateful. And the hermeneutic of, of generosity has been mentioned, but it, but it is really true that we, we were dialoguing um, and there, there was no, you know, um, big egos here. And uh, we were able to accomplish a lot. So I look forward to, um, to producing a volume out of this and, uh, and the conversation to continue. So once again, um, immense thanks to everybody involved.